I mentioned this briefly in the previous episode, but there was a movie that was released in 2007 called The Poughkeepsie Tapes. It was your typical found footage style of horror flick, the footage being the VHS tapes of a bizarre, torture-minded serial killer roaming upstate New York. Whoever promoted this movie should be paid substantially because it was brilliant. They opened up a YouTube account, uploaded this bizarre scene featuring a slender man in all black walking on all fours toward this terrified, bound-up woman. She sobbed into a mouth gag, and he rose up beside her, and then we just see this blank, expressionless mask as he slowly goes in for the kill. Then the scene just cuts to black. The poster of this video, Mr. Marketing himself, exclaimed that this was the genuine footage of an actual serial killer who roamed Poughkeepsie, and that there were hundreds of videos like this that were kept secret from the public. Now anyone local would already know that this was a lie, but man did the audience chew this up. If you so much as suggested that this footage was fake, backlash was sure to come. My friends and I actually made a dumb spoof video on YouTube called The Real Poughkeepsie Tapes, which was just scenes of us bored and miserable, unable to find anything to do in our little town. It was an inside joke, posted just for us to enjoy, but we wound up getting thousands of views almost overnight. The comments were angry, screaming that we were making light of a serial killer and his brutal deeds. The reason I bring this all up is because People have an innate fascination with serial killers, and are always hungry for some kind of inside look into the sociopathic mind. We don't want to be killers, but we want to understand them, know what they're thinking. When someone claims they have footage of a serial killer in his bizarre sick torture, we eat it up because it's practically contraband in our society. We're not supposed to see this, so we want to see it. But I'm sorry to say that the Poughkeepsie tapes steered a lot of people in the wrong direction. The slender little creepy man on all fours wasn't real, but Kendall Francois was. And honestly, I find him much more terrifying. He was a part of our regular daily routine, and we never knew it until he was arrested only a couple miles away from my house. Welcome to Hudson Valley Legends. In October of 1998, a woman went missing from a motel in Highland, New York, which is across the bridge and about 10 miles away from Poughkeepsie. The woman was Wendy Myers, a 30-year-old prostitute that was known around the town for her work, and sadly that's all I can say about Wendy. There wasn't much to report. Women go missing all the time, especially women who work the streets, and unfortunately, when someone disappears and there's no body, no daily 9 to 5, and nobody worrying, it sadly becomes cast aside as yet another victim to the streets. For some reason, we don't think that these women are human, or worth our attention, which can get me going on a wild tangent, but I'll continue the path of our story. After Wendy went missing from Highland, another woman was reported missing two months later, this time in the city of Poughkeepsie. This woman was 29-year-old Gina Barone, a cocaine addict who took to the streets when she needed a little extra cash to supply her habit. She was reported missing by her mother after getting out of her boyfriend's car one night at 2 a.m. and walking down Main Street. I guess they had gotten into a fight and she stormed off, unfortunately to never be seen again. When she disappeared, it might have been worthwhile to check out the similarities between her and Wendy, both in their late 20s, slim, brown hair, and prostitutes. Retrospect makes me wonder if maybe the next victims would have survived if the clues were strung together, but sadly, it doesn't work that way. No news stations picked up the story, no articles were written, and no attention was raised. Meanwhile, on Fulton Avenue in Poughkeepsie, right at the tiny border between city and town, a heavyset African-American man in his late 20s named Kendall Francois lived out his day-to-day -day life. He worked as a hall monitor at Arlington Middle School and was actually quite liked by the students. I'm 28 years old now, so I have a few friends a couple years older than me who remember him roaming the halls. They all told me the same thing. He was funny, personable, and playful with the kids, even though behind his back they all had a nickname for him. They called him Stinky. Not quite subtle or well thought out, but middle schoolers do tend to be blunt. 
Francois had his everyday routine. He would wake up, drive his mother to work in an old 1984 red Subaru, drop her off, and then go about his day. However, his little red car was actually quite well known in City of Poughkeepsie, just not by anyone we would normally ask questions of. The prostitutes on Main Street knew it all too well and dreaded when they saw it roll up in front of them. They knew Kendall as something other than just a middle school attendant. They knew him as a John who visited frequently and who could get very rough. They gossiped to one another, had a sort of unofficial blacklist. They told each other to take caution when you get in with him. He can get out of hand. Even though they knew his reputation, unfortunately several more women would sit beside him in his car and be taken to 99 Fulton Avenue, where he would strangle them to death and stuff them into large garbage bags. They would then be given a rather unceremonious resting place beside the other women he murdered, stowed away in the attic or in the basement. The next half of this podcast is going to be a little more graphic, so just a fair warning to those who are sensitive to violence or squeamish. Two more women went missing, Kathy Marsh and Kathleen Hurley. At this point, the police began to suspect something unusual was going on. For so many prostitutes to go missing in such a short period of time, they were beginning to worry that maybe they had a serial offender on their hands. After investigating and speaking with some of the known street workers, they were given a list of Johns who came through and were notorious for being a bit rough. The one who stood out was Kendall Francois. The women explained that he would get very forceful and violent. He liked to choke, and then he'd work into a furious anger afterwards, claiming that he felt he didn't get his money's worth out of them. The police began to watch Francois's house, but with small-town budgets and no bodies to be found, the watch was discontinued quickly. By September of 1998, Kendall had claimed eight victims, all of whom were bagged and kept in his house. It should be noted that by this point, there had been a year's worth of decay occurring in his attic. The smell was horrendous and was leaking out into the road. The neighbors complained, and when asked about it, Kendall would reply that it was just dead raccoons stuck in the walls, and he was working on getting it taken care of. I was too young to really have any personal witness to this house. I seldom had reason to be on Fulton Ave when I was 11 years old. One local man I spoke to said he distinctly remembers driving by the house and smelling it, like it became a norm. Just that something stunk on Fulton Ave, and when you'd pass by, you'd just roll up the windows. I mean, to me, that's shocking. I feel like that would be a smoking gun, especially when this man had been under surveillance. But I'm also not a police officer. I'm sure there is much more paperwork that has to be done other than, this house smells, let's go check it. And I'm actually not that far off in that regard. The town and city police were working with the FBI to sort this out. They needed stronger evidence than he smells like death, he must be a killer. And on top of it, Francois had just been administered a lie detector test, which he passed with no problems. Just a note for those of you who aren't familiar with how a lie detector works, they are not a guaranteed answer. A sociopathic mind can easily trick themselves through it by staying calm and collected. And if there's anything that could be said about Kendall, he never seemed to be nervous or under pressure. So while television and movies lead us to believe they can be a surefire admission of guilt, that's not always necessarily the case. Also, it must be noted that Francois had lawyered up by this time. He was starting to be questioned, and he wouldn't exactly admit to the crime right up front, would he? On September 1st, 1998, things changed very quickly in the case. Francois had picked up a young woman early that morning, made his negotiations with her, and brought her back to the house. He once again broke into his rage and started to strangle her, but she escaped from his clutches. She talked some sense into him, asking that he just take her back to Main Street so they could just forget about the whole ordeal. For me personally, I can't understand why she would even consider getting in a car with him at that point. 
When I try to put myself in that situation, I see myself hauling ass running down the road, screaming in terror. But I have never truly been in any sort of danger like she was. So who knows what went through her mind as he drove her quietly back to Main Street and let her out. As soon as she escaped from him, she ran to tell someone at a gas station what had just happened, that she had been assaulted. At the same time, the police were doing traffic stops, showing pictures of the missing women and asking if anyone had information. By this point, the local news had begun to explode with mass hysteria and fear. The secret was out that a serial killer was on the loose in Poughkeepsie and was lurking the streets. The gas station attendant quickly called the police over from the stop just down the road and told them what happened. Within an hour, they had her in questioning and told her how vital it was that she tell them what happened. It was a matter of life and death for her colleagues on the street. She eventually caved and told the story, giving the police the break they finally needed. She filed a complaint against Kendall Francois, and this gave the police the chance to pull the trigger and move in on him. They brought him in, and he confessed to one murder, that of the most recent woman in 1998 named Katina Newmaster. While actually this is the usual story, I've actually read that he confessed to three of the women right up front. I'm not entirely sure what exactly was said in the interrogation room, but what is fact is that he was charged with one count of murder, and the next day the police were at 99 Fulton Avenue with a search warrant. What they found there were the garbage bags stuffed with women, littering the floor of the attic like forgotten toys long cast away. The stench was unbearable. The police arrived decked in hazmat suits, removing the bags one by one. A retired City of Poughkeepsie detective, who asked to remain anonymous, spoke to me about the findings in Kendall's house. He said that the house was littered with garbage everywhere, bags and bags of rotting food and waste. It was shin high, and it was unusually hot for September, so the smell was practically toxic. As they searched the house, including the attic and the basement, they stepped in and over the bags with the old corpses, not even realizing that they were bodies at first, just more trash strewn about the place. It wasn't until they took a closer look that they saw bones among the heaps of rancid garbage. Kendall Francois was ultimately charged with eight counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. While the town was screaming for the death penalty, his defense team pled guilty in order to avoid trial by jury and sneak out of the justification of death. In August of 2000, Kendall Francois was sentenced to life in prison and spent the remainder of his years in Attica. He died on September 11th of 2014 at the age of 43. Although it is stated that he contracted HIV from his victims, it's not exactly specified as the cause of death, and it is instead listed as natural causes. With the beginning of the millennium came the end of a horrible crime spree that haunted Poughkeepsie for quite some time. In some ways, it put us on the map. We had never really had a situation of this magnitude in recent history, so it definitely stirred some new emotions. To this day, it's sometimes thought that the police were doing a poor job and mishandled the case. How could they have let eight women die by the hands of some monster? How could they let Kendall Francois roam the streets when they were almost certain it was him? From the readings I've done on this case, I think my opinion is valid in that they did the best they could. It's as simple as that. They had limited resources, minimal budgets, and they never dealt with anything this horrific before. And while unfortunately eight women had to lose their lives to a horrible crime, it begs an answer to a bigger question that has less to do with the police and more to do with us as humans. Why is it that we don't see the faces of poverty and drug addiction until it's far too late? All you can hope is that with the end of Kendall Francois' story comes a new understanding of the serial killer mind and how we can stay safe. Next episode will be something much less violent, and maybe inspiring to those who turn an eye to the spiritual. A few miles into the woods of Putnam County, New York, are some historic features that, 
although written off by some scholars as just routine colonial history, are considered possibly religious relics that have stood for thousands of years. Next time on Hudson Valley Legends. Thank you for listening to Hudson Valley Legends. Written and narrated by Tony O'Dell. Produced by Michael McDermott. Music is also by Michael McDermott. He's a man of many talents. You can email us at hvlegends at gmail.com with comments, feedback, or topic suggestions you may have. If we discuss a topic, I'll gladly give you credit where credit is due. So please, tell me some stories and let's talk. This show wouldn't be possible without the continued support of you, the listeners. I'm blown away by all the wonderful feedback that I've received so far, and it's been a privilege speaking to all of you. I will do the best I can to keep the show the best it can be, so stick around because we've got a lot more topics to cover. If you're a really big fan and want to help the Hudson Valley Legends show get bigger and better, then I kindly ask you to check out my Patreon page and consider donating. Even just a dollar per episode will help in huge ways. This show is made out of love and admiration for the beautiful area we live in, and while love and admiration is what keeps me going, it unfortunately does not pay for the audio equipment or the producer. He's a nice guy, but I think he'd be a whole lot nicer if I could pay him. So please, consider donating. There'll be lots of fun, cool perks by donating to the Patreon page, and I'll have much more information for you in upcoming episodes. Also, I'm very much interested in advertising some local businesses, especially those in the Hudson Valley. If interested, please contact me at hvlegends at gmail.com and let me know what it is you do. I want to help keep this place as vibrant and alive as the history, so send me an email and I'll happily promote your business, craft, or whatever it is you'd like to get out there. And one last thing. Hudson Valley Legends was originally a subset of a podcast called Live From Somewhere. Dom is the reason that we're doing this today, and he's been a fantastic support since we were freshmen in college, actually. So please, consider subscribing and listening. It's much more lighthearted, it's more of a funny podcast where Dom and I discuss our current going-ons. Just a fair warning, though, there's lots of colorful language. So check that out at www.lfspod.com or search for it on iTunes. Again, thank you for listening to Hudson Valley Legends.